Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Five Bytes Podcast. I'm your host, Rory Monahan. Coming up on this week's episode, the LockBit ransomware gang have themselves been breached in a pretty startling attack by a multinational task force. VMware has publicly addressed concerns relating to its recent announcements and changes. And Google makes a play to convince Windows 10 users to switch to its Google Flex OS. For this and more, keep listening to this episode of the podcast, which as always is brought to you by my sponsors. And that includes ControlUp, end-to-end digital experience management for the work from anywhere era. ControlUp, happy users, happy IT. And also brought to you by Netrix Policy Pack, where you use Group Policy, Policy Pack Cloud, or MDM to remove local admin rights, manage and lockdown applications, Java, browsers, and mitigate ransomware, plus more. And of course, also brought to you by Numescent, the inventors of the first and only cloud-native container management platform for Windows desktops. If you enjoy the show each week, you have these awesome sponsors to thank. And now for some news. This was a wild week in InfoSec, as the infamous LockBit ransomware gang have themselves been breached. It is alleged the Kronos Task Force, made up of authorities from the US and UK plus Europol, managed to pull off an attack of their own. It is alleged the task force infiltrated the gang's infrastructure leveraging CVE-2023-3824, which is a vulnerability in PHP that can lead to a buffer overflow and a stack information leak due to improper bounds checking within the var underscore dir underscore read function. This issue can allow an attacker to initiate memory corruption by compelling the application to open a specially crafted FAR archive file, allowing the attacker to corrupt memory or cause a denial of service condition. And as the name suggests, you know, it's got 2023 in the name. This is a vulnerability which has been known for several months. So it's surprising that a cyber gang who lives and breeds vulnerabilities had left itself vulnerable to breach using what was a pretty high severity vulnerability. The LockBit leak site was updated by the task force to show the logos of the US, UK, and Europol agencies with a message stating it is now under the control of the UK, US, and the Kronos task force. And if you haven't seen a screenshot or the leak site for yourself, it is worth checking out. It's pretty incredible to see. And I'll share a link with this episode if you want to check it out for yourself with episode 322 at 5 bytespodcastcom or you could check out the YouTube edition. I'll show it in the video as well. And if you're not familiar, if this is the first episode of this podcast you've listened to, uh, well, the LockBit ransomware gang has been responsible for several high profile breaches, such as though at Boeing, Royal Mail in the UK, and my own home country's health service, the HSE. So they've been pretty prolific and now they themselves have been breached and this has led to several arrests, the release of decryptors, that will hopefully at least provide some path forward for some of LockBit's victims. And if nothing else, this will hopefully soften the cough of those responsible in the LockBit ransomware gang. So a good news story to start with this week, a rare win against ransomware gangs. In a recent article published by VMware, they admitted that the many recently announced changes resulted in many questions and concerns as customers evaluate how to maximize value from VMware products. In a blog post by Prashant Shanoi, who is VP of Product and Technical Marketing for the Cloud Infrastructure Platforms and Solutions, basically stated everyone is making the move to subscription licensing and focused on license portability in the article and the benefits of this, which may wrinkle some customers the wrong way, uh, because obviously this is trying to put a positive spin on the license change that uh, many have been upset about. Ars Technica reported Chinoy claimed the discontinuation of VMware products is being done so that Broadcom can focus on VMware Cloud Foundation and vSphere Foundation, and this should be beneficial because, quote, Offering a few offerings that are lower in price on the high end and are packed with more value for the same or less cost on the lower end makes business sense for customers, partners, and VMware, end quote. 
and regarding the controversial changes to the partner ecosystem, which was seeing a reduction in the number of partners overall, the post goes on to suggest that this change makes business sense for Broadcom to have close relationships with its most strategic VMware customers to make sure VMware Cloud Foundation is being adopted, used, and providing customer value. That's in relation to the fact that VMware is taking more of its large customers in-house and away from its partners. However, they go on to say that they expect there will be a role change in accounts that will have to be worked through so that both Broadcom and VMware's partners are providing the most value and greatest impact to strategic customers. And partners will play a critical role in adding value beyond what Broadcom may be able. So I don't know, is that kind of an about face and they're saying that partners will be brought more into the fold again or if this is just spin to make it seem a lot softer than the change actually is. Shinoi went on to argue that Broadcom identified things that needed to change and as a responsible company made the changes quickly and decisively and stated quote the changes that have taken place over the past 60 plus days were absolutely necessary. So I don't think this is going to appease customers who may be upset by these changes, but it is certainly a statement that is unequivocal and decisive, suggesting that this is the path they're going forward with, even if it is going to upset customers. At least that's the way I interpret it. What is being called an out of band hotfix for FS Logix, or at least according to the announcement, has been released and, and this is reportedly to expedite the adoption process of the new Microsoft Teams in anticipation of the upcoming June 30th deprecation of the classic Teams version. Guy Leach shared that unfortunately the new Teams does not currently work on Windows Server 2019. It crashes and Marco Zimmerman on Twitter followed up and suggested that the issues are specifically for those who use OneDrive or any other online file service on the same host. So if you have server 2019 and you're using it for maybe published desktops or something like that and expect the new teams to work on that, you should start testing as soon as possible because June 30th is not far away. Google is testing a new feature to prevent malicious public websites from pivoting through a user's Chrome browser to attack devices and services on their internal private networks. It appears the feature will present a warning information page but it reads that a refresh will proceed past that warning, so it could easily be bypassed with a simple refresh of the browser. BleepyComputer.com reports that the motivation behind this development is to prevent malicious websites on the internet from exploiting flaws on devices and servers in users' internal networks, which were presumed safe from internet-based threats. This includes protecting against unauthorized access to users' routers and software interfaces running on local devices, which is a growing concern as more applications deploy web interfaces, assuming non-existent protections. I have to correct a recent story that I had on the podcast. I recently shared a story by Tom's Hardware about a cyber attack on a Swiss company that leveraged smart toothbrushes for a denial of service attack. Well, thanks to Martin Dews, who shared that Tom's Hardware has published an update to correct this story. It did not occur, and reportedly, the security company who published the report originally stated there was confusion caused by a mistranslation. The story reportedly got published by multiple outlets and appears to have been pushed by a German outlet who interpreted the report as depicting an event that really happened, but it did not. The German report was then circulated by media outlets in English who appeared to rely on the same translation or interpretation. I should have known better, honestly, because it seemed odd to me that such an attack would occur to target one Swiss company. Like, getting an army of toothbrushes to attack a single company seemed a bit odd. So I vow that I will try to do better, but it is getting harder when researching for this podcast as some of the tech outlets have changed their model and they repeat old stories as though they're new. They push clickbait articles mixed in with regular content. And obviously Twitter has just turned into a complete dumpster fire, which that was one of my go-to sources in the past. So I'm going to perhaps narrow my scope for sources going forward. I won't name names, but one outlet in particular that I used to use a quite a bit completely transformed the format of their site. So I've been using them less and less, and I guess I have to scrutinize even more 
the sites that I use and just seeing that other outlets have published the same story may not be enough. So not making any excuses. I know there are problems with some of the sources, so I just need to do a better job of vetting what I'm going to be talking about on the podcast. So I'm going to work on that. One password has acquired Collide, which is an endpoint security platform for an undisclosed amount. TechCrunch.com reports that all of Collide's 30 employees will join one password as an intact team. In an email interview about the acquisition, it was stated, quote, the hybrid work anywhere and on any device workforce is here to stay and security has seen a massive impact as a result of the shift. Employees are working across a mix of personal and work issue devices and most organizations don't have a good handle on how to secure access to their applications and data on those devices. Collide is the only company in the market with this kind of device security and contextual access management solution that can check the health status of a device at the point of authentication in real time before granting access to company applications. 1Password seems to be a company on the rise, recording north of $250 million in annual recurring revenue with a client base of over 100,000 organizations, and they're expecting to add 250 jobs this year. So certainly bucking that trend of decline in the tech industry. It'll be interesting to see how this works out for them. And it's also very interesting that they're making a move that assumes work from anywhere and hybrid work is the future. Interestingly, Reuters posted an article about Google's Flex OS and the potential for individuals with Windows 10 machines that cannot be upgraded to Windows 11 simply pivoting to using Flex OS. The report suggests 240 million PCs could be sent to landfills as demand for devices incapable of running Windows 11 and being stuck on an OS that will be unable to receive updates could force people's hands to simply upgrade their hardware to get on a supported OS that can get updates. And kind of reading between the lines, this story, quote unquote, seems to be kind of a planted story and marketing push from Google to get people thinking about just repurposing that hardware and running Google's Flex OS instead, which of course would mean trying to figure out how to handle those Windows applications and the need for those on this Flex OS, which they've made some plays about being able to stream those applications and run them on Flex OS, which yeah, certainly would be possible with the correct solution. So I'm not saying it's not a viable solution for enterprises. It might be. I just find it interesting that they're planting this type of story. But now this episode's scripts, tricks, and tips. First up, great news for the community. Ronnie Hamilton has announced the first meeting of the year for the new EUC Ireland group and stated you should please keep the 21st of March free and follow at EUC Ireland on Twitter for updates. And the awesome Thorsten once again shared some really great content on Twitter. If you're not following him on Twitter, be sure to. Uh, but in this case, it was the CVE Prioritizer, which is an open source tool designed to assist in prioritizing the patching of vulnerabilities. It integrates data from CVSS, EPSS, and CISA's KEV catalog to offer insights into the probability of exploitation and the potential effects of vulnerabilities on your systems. So a great one for every organization to use, I would think. Also awesome was Patch My PC's recent article about the Windows Management Instrumentation Tester Tool, which is built into all Windows NT-based operating systems. In the article for this, they go through how to use the tool and the use cases for the tool, which includes troubleshooting application issues for apps that rely on WMI, ensuring the correct firewall rules are enabled for remote WMI connection, querying application-specific namespaces to verify data stored within the repository, manually invoking application-specific methods to clear on classes or instance data, and more. So a really useful tool that you may want to read up on more. And I'll share a link to that article as I do with everything mentioned on every episode of the podcast. With this episode, you'll find it at 5 Michael Nihas recently posted a blog on Windows Apps folder and how it bloats and how to keep on top of managing it. So that's another great one for administrators. The Register posted an article this week that could have been news, but I figured it was more of a tip 
and this one goes through how to force windows crashes and blue screens so if you want to do some stress testing or maybe you're doing proof of concepts of various different monitoring tools and you want to test them out this could be a useful one for simulating or not even simulating but causing actual crashes for troubleshooting purposes Finally, Patrick Van Den Born on Twitter tweeted, Attention AVD admins. If you're experiencing an authentication loop with Entry ID single sign-on on AVD, membership in built-in slash account operators group could be the culprit. And he states you should look out for error code RDP underscore sec underscore RDS AAD auth underscore server with 0XD00006D in the event log. I hate reading out those kinds of errors on the podcast, but hey, I just did it. And this goes as a remote desktop services dash RDP core CDV. Well, that's it for this episode of the podcast. Thank you all so much for listening.